Welcome back. I tell you, it's hard to believe we are now on, uh, I guess, section nine of Psalm 139. I have thoroughly enjoyed going through this chapter. As I told you back, uh, I think in week one, um, Psalm 139 is a chapter that has changed my life in so many ways. And I was challenged as a teenager by an evangelist to read this chapter every day for 30 days and it will change your world. It will revolutionize how you live. And I took up the challenge uh, and it did. Uh, and tonight we're going to be looking, or today, we're going to be looking at uh, the last two verses uh, of Psalm 139, 23 and 24, which have become my life verses. Uh, someone asked me, what's your life verse? I say Psalm 139, 23 and 24. So I'm anxious uh, to get uh, into these verses uh, and what they've meant to me and hopefully what they will mean to you. In the meantime, I do want you also, though, get your Bibles out, turn to Psalm 139. Uh, 23 and 24, but also look at Job in the Old Testament, Job 31, verse 6, Job 31, verse 6, and then Matthew 7, 13 and 14. So Job 31, 6, and Matthew 7, 13 uh, and 14 as well. As you get there, though, let me read a hymn uh, to you. Uh, this is one that was written in 1902, so it's, it gets a little over 120 years old. Uh, but I think it really will tie in with the scripture that we're going to be looking at today as well. And it's called, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Have Thine Own Way. And it goes like this. Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Have Thine Own Way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Have Thine Own Way. Search me and try me, master today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. As in thy presence, humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only always living in me. Verse two says, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, master today. And that's going to be a reference uh, to the scripture that we're going to be looking at today in Psalm 139. So before we get started, let's start with a word of prayer. Father God, thank you that you are the God that can be trusted for us to say to you, have thine own way, Lord. And Father, we confess that we don't do that enough. In fact, it's truth we know, Father, we ask many times for you to do it our way. For us to get the way that we want things to be done. And we're sorry for that. God, your way is the way that leads to holiness. Your way is the way that leads to life. It leads to completeness. It leads to wholeness. So, Father, would you help us as your people today, as we open up your words, to be people that truly that can get to the point, God, have your way in and through and in spite of our lives. Give us ears, Father, today to hear what it is you and you alone want to say. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's hard to believe we had nine lessons on Psalm 139, and I hope that you've enjoyed them. And one of the things we've talked about so often is that you really get a range of emotions in Psalm 139. So really, at whatever stage in life that you're at, or whether you're on a high mountain or whether you're in a valley, to me, Psalm 139 is a chapter that will speak to you. It's a chapter that throughout my life I've noticed there's never been a time that it hasn't applied. There's never been a time that it hasn't, didn't do something for me. It was in each time of my life as I read this, try to read it almost every day, it speaks to me at wherever I'm at. However, today I'll be honest with you, the last two weeks have been kind of a hard. Uh, go back if you haven't, if you haven't uh, seen those lessons, go back and look at them. Um, but it was kind of a hard period uh, in as the psalmist was being very real with his emotions and having a visceral reaction to sin and destruction around him and wickedness around him. Uh, and we dealt with that. 
However, today, um, notice how this psalm closes. And so if you got your Bibles, let's look at Psalm 139, 23, and 24. Miss Tori, she'll do our reading today. So Miss Tori, will you read that, please? Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. You got to read that one more time, Miss Tori. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. One more time. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. As I've said, these have become my life verses. And what I love here is that if you get, if you understand what this prayer is, that this is, well, that's what it is. It's a prayer. And yet it comes at the end after we've been dealing with a gut reaction to sin and hatred towards it and the wicked. God, won't you do something? And God, when are you going to do something? And, and by the way, God, I want you to do something about it. And yet we could flow right from that guttural, guttural reaction, visceral reaction hatred towards sin and wickedness. And yet now the psalmist, notice how he transitions. And the first thing he says is, search me, God. Search me. So after the psalmist has opened up about wickedness and those that are in open rebellion and God, what, when are you going to do something about them? And God, I have a visceral reaction to them. All of a sudden, though, the focus becomes back on, wait a minute, God, Search me. God, make sure. Check me out. Help me not just to see what I think I'm seeing in others without realizing, is that in my own life? Christ talked so often about the speck versus the log, that we look at the speck in someone else's eye, and we get on them for that without realizing there's a beam in our own eye that Christ said. And what we see here is the psalmist is saying, first, search me, God. Search me. I told you, I... I uh, told you about looking at Job 31.6. And if you if you've got your Bibles, you've gone there. Job 31.6 says this, let him weigh me with accurate scales and let God know my integrity. So this is Job now. He's having these moments where he's going back and forth. And why is God allowing these things to happen to him? And he doesn't understand it. And people are saying, Job, there's something wrong with you. What's going on with you? What sin have you entertained? And Job is saying, I don't know of anything. And by the way, you and I, we know what happened at the beginning. We know Job is right. Job is right. Job is right. Job was singled out because he was holy. He was singled out because he loved the Lord. He was singled out because of that. And yet even here, Job is saying, let him, meaning let God, Weigh me with accurate seals. What he's saying here is that I totally trust. I, I, I know the life that I've been trying to live. Let God weigh me. Let God search me. Let God know me. Let God put me on the scales. You know, it's interesting. Most of the time in our culture, scales are a bad thing. Who wants to get on scales? You go to the doctor's office, where do they always want you to do? They always want you to get on the scales. Who wants to get on the scales? No, you know, and they never tell you. They'll just go move that little thing and they just write it down and then they just move on. Nobody wants to get on scales. Most people, though, get on scales almost every day. Many people do. They get on scales every day. And yet it's something that we don't look forward to. And yet Job here is saying, let him weigh me. Let God put me on the scales. Let him put me up there and weigh. See what's going on. And here the psalmist is saying at the end of Psalm 39, search me, God. Ties in with this. Test me. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. God, put me on the scales. See what I'm made of. What do you see? What's coming up on there? What is it? What's heavy in my life? What needs to be heavier in my life? God, what needs to be taken out? Weigh me in the balance. Weigh me. Put me on the scales. 
what was in the Old Testament when the king, remember the hand writing on the wall in Persian, and the king said, what? You have been weighed. You have been weighed and have been found wanting. And Daniel gave the prophecy that this night, the kingdom will be taken from you. God has come and God weighed you. You were put on the scales and you were found lacking. And Job is saying here, let God weigh me, put me on the scales. And by the way, that ought to be the desire of you and I. And it says, it's not a fun thing to be weighed by God, but it's a thing that what Job is saying is that I know that I can trust him. And I know that he knows, he knows me. And you and I, as we look here at Psalm 139, it's this aspect of God, search me, God. We've dealt with the world. We've dealt with the wicked. We've dealt with the openly defiant. And here at the end, it all comes down to God, search me, God. God, know me. Test me. I'll be honest with you, this is the part that really speaks to me. And know my anxious thoughts. I'll be honest with you, I'm someone that I have anxious thoughts. Or I can the enemy comes and I start listening to the enemy more than I'm listening to God. All of a sudden the cares of this world, all of a sudden the wants of this world, all of a sudden the fears of this world, they all come up and you know what they all lead to? Anxious thoughts. And the psalmist says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. What you see here is that the psalmist is saying, God, I want to be so totally open to you. I don't want to withhold anything. Search me. Know me. Test me. And even know my fears. Know my doubts. Know my anxieties. You know that, that verse in Philippians that many Christians talk about being anxious for nothing. I'll be honest with you, I'm not there yet. I know it's the goal. And I'm trying hard to get there. But what the psalmist is saying here, that God, I want you to search me. Put me up there. Put me on the scales. Focus in on me. Know every part of me. Even my fears. Even my anxieties. I don't want to withhold those from you. Many times those are the things that we keep from God. You know, it's amazing. We really don't go to God with those things that are anxieties. We kind of keep those because we think they're almost kind of negatives against us. They think they're shortcomings of us. So many times we kind of we're fearful to go with God, to God for that. More than we think, God got kind of be tough. And then he's saying here, know my anxious thoughts, know my fears, know my anxieties. This idea of this being totally open to God. So search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. Notice this now. Don't miss this. See if there's any offensive way in me. That's the crux. And let's just say this. I think many times we as Christians, we stop with the searching, the know me, and the test me. And the know my fears. But he doesn't. To be true or to be careful, the psalmist goes on and says, not only search me, know me, test me, know my fears, know my anxious thoughts, but then see if there is any offensive way in me. Search me so completely that, oh God, if something in me, by the way, what's this that's offensive? Offensive to who? Offensive to God. God, search my life, and if there is anything in me that is offensive to you, reveal that to me. Let me know that. You and I ought to desire that relationship with God that we can say, God, don't just search me and know me, but God, check my life. God, if there is hidden sin, if there is sin in there that I'm entertaining, God, Help me to check it. God, reveal that to me. And God, reveal to me also then the seriousness of that. I'll be honest with you. In the church, we don't understand the seriousness of sin. Now, we understand the seriousness of sin when it comes to lost people and keeping them out of heaven. 
We get that. But in the church, we don't understand the seriousness of sin, of how it breaks our relationship with God, how it breaks our relationship with our Father. It inhibits us. It puts a barrier that's there. Why? Why can't God overlook it? Because God's holy. God is holy. God has called us. We are a redeemed people. And he has called us from death into life. And yet the sad fact is that many times we want to play with death. We want to play with death. And we wonder why God doesn't bless that. And the psalmist here says, see if there's any offensive way in me. By the way, when it says see, it's not, it, it doesn't mean God, just keep it to yourself. No, this idea of seeing if there's any offensive way means to come clean with me. Make it very known to me that I'm struggling with this, that this is an issue. God, if there's anything offensive in my life to you, show me. Reveal that to me. So search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Test me. Know my thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. And then you got to love this. And lead me. Lead me in the way of everlasting. I asked you to turn to Matthew earlier. Matthew 7, beginning with verse 13. Notice this. This is what Christ says. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Let me read that again to you. Lead me. I'll tie in with this. Lead me in the way everlasting. Jesus says this. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. And the psalmist here says, search me, O God, know my heart. Test me, know my anxious thoughts. God, see if there's any offensive way in me. And then you got to love this and lead me. And lead me. This touches me because Christ is saying here, that gate, many miss it. You know why they do? Because they don't follow the end of this verse. They don't let God lead. They think they figure it out on their own. So they take the wide avenues. They take what looks to be real, but it's not. They take what looks to be life, but it's not. And then they don't check. They just go on with it. They get on that road and they just keep going, not knowing that there's a cliff at the end. They just keep going. And yet the psalmist is saying here, God, you're the one that leads. Lead me to the way everlasting. To those of you and I that are part of the family of God, we understand the narrow way. And the narrow way means there's only one way to the Father. Christ has said it. There's only one way to the Father, and that's through Christ. That's through him. The fascinating thing is, or the wonderful thing is, that he's the one that does the leading. He stands at the door. He knocks. He opens the door. He wants to come in to us. He wants to lead us along the narrow way. And by the way, along the narrow way, when he does the leading, we're never alone. And he's promised that we won't be. He has said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will walk with you on the way. The challenges that you and I need to do is the following. And lead me in the way everlasting. And part of God leading us, that's the part that he does. And by the way, he's promised that he will. He's promised that he will lead us. Christ said when he left his disciples, it's good for you that I go. Not because I'm going to leave you for thousands of years and you're not going to know anything about me and have no experience. No, he says, it's good for you that I go because there's one coming that's the comforter who's coming after me.
and he will be the down payment. He will be the one that will remind you that will that will live in your hearts and in your minds that you are not alone. He's the one that will do the leading. What you and I do is we do the following. And the great thing is, as he lives in me, as he lives in you, what he leads, he leads daily. That he's a vibrant, relatable being that leads me and leads you and desires to do that and wants to do that. And so therefore, my job is, God, you do the leading and I'll do the following. And by the way, it's a whole lot easier to do the following when you and I do the first part of this of this, these two verses. When you and I say, search me, O God, know my heart, God, try me and know my anxious thoughts. Lord, point out if there's any wicked offensive way in me. When you and I pray all of that and sincerely pray that, the leading and the following, they go hand in hand. They do. And I'm not going to say this. I'm not going to tell you it's not always easy. Because sometimes when we say to God, point out if there's any wicked offensive way in me, God will do that. Why? Because for one thing, he's faithful to me. He's faithful to you. He's faithful to himself. He will do that because he's holy and because he's righteous. Again, not to put us in our place, but to bring life to us. However, sometimes when that happens, it does get uncomfortable. Because at that moment, you and I have a decision to make. God has revealed that. Am I going to continue to follow in the way of everlasting? Or am I going to sit here and play with this wicked offensive thing? Am I going to continue to deal with it? If I continue to deal with it, I'm not following. I'm not. I'm delaying. And as I delay and as you delay, we miss out on the blessing of following. See, the secret secret, if you want to say there's a secret, the secret is allowing the Spirit to lead and that you and I follow on a daily basis. That's the secret. Being open. Search me, God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. Lord, see if there be any wicked offensive way in me and lead me in your way of everlasting. That has been my life first. I'm so grateful that we've been able to end this Psalm 139 on those verses. And I pray that they become your life verses today. I pray that you get to the point where you can live on a daily basis. Search me, oh God. God, weigh me. God, I trust you. I know that you're good. Search me, oh God. Try me and know my thoughts. Lord, see if there be any wicked offensive way in me and lead me in the way. To where? To everlasting life. Father, I pray that we've been faithful to the reading of your word. And I pray that we have been faithful to the reading of your word in all of Psalm 139. Oh God, if anything has been said, done, or thought that goes contrary to it, please erase it from our minds, from our memories, and from our experience. God, thank you for this chapter. Thank you for all the verses. But oh God, I thank you personally for verses 23 and 24. Father, I thank you that it's those verses that you have worked in and through and in spite of my life. It's those verses that I try to live on a daily basis. And you've been so faithful to that. And I thank you for that today. God, would you help us to be people that truly and earnestly and honestly ask you to search us, to know us, to try us, to even know our anxious thoughts, and to see if there's any offensive way in us. And then, Father, lead. And as you lead, would you help us to follow? Would you help us to realize that sweet relationship that you desire with us is there? But at the same time, help us to realize sin inhibits it. And help us not to entertain sin. Help us to nip it in the bud, to be aware of it, to be aware that there is an enemy in my soul, there's an enemy of our soul, that he is seeking to do everything in his power to entice us with sin. Give us the wherewithal that we rely on you to point it out in our lives and that we then follow you. God, thank you that you not only are the God that leads, but that you are the God that can be followed. In fact, you're the God that longs to be followed. Thank you for that today. 
Thank you for Psalm 139. We ask all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.